listening to Your Ultimate Life with Kellen Flukiger, only on L.A. Talk Radio. All right, welcome today to Your Ultimate Life. My Phoenix and I are here to help you create a life of purpose, prosperity, and joy by serving with your gifts. Today I have a great guest I'm excited to have with me, uh, Peter Weimer. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's always good to talk to you, Kellen. Well, thanks for being on the show. And today, uh, Peter has a, a really interesting uh, set of circumstances and things he's done in his life, but I'm not going to spoil it with any of that. We'll introduce him <laughs> gradually through the whole show. So, Peter, what is the most, if I ask you, I know you love story and telling stories and you do it with video and stuff, it says on their creative content expert, and that's true, I can attest. So what is the mo- the two or three most important keys for people to know and use as the storyteller? I think the most important thing is that you're honest and genuine with, with, with your story. So any business, any storyteller, any context, if someone is really in touch with their feelings and with their experiences and they're conveying that and they're talking about what they need to overcome to get where they are today and really painting the picture in a way that that the majority of people listening can relate to, it's going to be poignant. It's going to affect people emotionally. It's going to motivate people no matter what the circumstance. So I, I think I think the connection of the storyteller to the story is, I would say, is the most important factor. Connection of the storyteller to the story. So when somebody comes to you for help and they often, I'm sure this is the case, struggle with both the speaking aspect and the vulnerability aspect and the exposure, which is partly vulnerability, but partly also, uh, you know, performing in front of somebody, where do you start? in helping somebody create that connection between themselves and the story, not just, I mean, it's there because it's their story, but as they tell it in public. Yeah, I think the first thing is to understand what their core values are and what's important to them. So the first conversation I would have would be that, what are the three most important things in your life, in your existence, that motivate you, that, you know, that have you do what you do and have the friends that you have and be the way you are with your family and be the way you are in your business. It's that, it's that linchpin uh, that, that holds you to everything you do. So for example, if, if somebody has a love for rocks, which sounds incredibly boring, right? But if somebody has a love for rocks and they have a passion for it, And they've always had this skill where they can find these amazing rocks and they went to school and they studied the best rocks. And now they have this business where they can identify stones and have the most beautiful stones that they can offer people. Suddenly it's not just about what the value of the stone is. It's about the story behind the stone and where you find the stone and, and where the person who has been connected to this whole, this whole world is bringing you into that world and you feel like you are now a unique part of that story. You feel like you have now been brought in to that passion and brought into that excitement. And I pick stones because most people would say, I don't care about stones, but you'd be really surprised. Uh, I actually had a client that did that and his business just exploded when he was able to get up and tell a story and talk about how when he was five years old, he just had this knack of knowing where these precious stones were and understanding what their energy is and their value and their purpose. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's where I would start. It doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, another client of mine is an artist and, and she was having a difficult time selling her products because she was just pushing her products out there. She was doing it a way where it was sales. And I just started asking her, well, well why do you create this piece of art? And why do you create that piece of art? And it all has to do with her interpretation of home and her interpretation of animals and how animals function in in the ecological world that she's in and water and the earth and all these amazing things. And once she started talking about that and expressing her views, and it became clear that her art was a channel to express those feelings and those connections that she has, a lot of people are connected with those stories. And she doesn't have to worry about selling her art anymore because people connect with her story and they want part of that story. They want to be a part of it. So it sounds like the key is helping people understand that it is 
the connection to their story that's valuable and then have the the courage and then the skill that you help them develop to tell that connection story so that so that the audience can participate in a visceral way exactly visceral is the perfect word because that's and that's the beauty of video is that it's communicating on so many levels you have the conversation which is the intellectual input you have the tone of voice which which affects the emotional response and effect and then you also have all the visuals that you can add to support and actually tell other stories while the story is being told so you have this influx of information and it hits you on a visceral level on many levels but yes i i do think that the visceral connection is the number one advantage to video say over reading text or over uh, looking at, at photographs so you have over the years developed a particular skill of visual storytelling and so forth uh, I don't know that it, you know, you were born that way. Maybe you were, I don't know. Maybe you drew, <laughs> drew something on your diaper right out of the box. But why don't you, t why don't you tell, <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, who knows? When I was a kid, we had cloth diapers. We didn't have pampers. Yeah, anyway. I, think I'm, I think I'm old enough for cloth diapers. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Early all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so tell tell me how you got started. Like, I want to note some details that I don't know about you. I know some, sure. but I'm sure I don't know. How did you get started with excitement around two things? Helping people tell stories. Why is that? How did you end up there? And then how did you get to the visual part where the video and the supporting elements and stuff became so important to you? Well, it all started with being a show off when I was a kid. Uh, I, 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 wanted, I wanted to be an actor and I wanted to play roles and I wanted to tell stories and I really loved being the center of attention and, uh, and, and telling stories. And when I was a little kid, like third grade, I wrote a play and I started in it and I just loved getting up and being a character and, and having a plot and having a, having a set and all of that stuff. And for many, many years, um, I wanted to be an actor. I did some acting when I was younger, uh, when I was a kid and, and young adulthood. But at one point I realized it's not about my ego. It's not about me getting in front of people and showing off and being a character and being appreciated for that. Although recognition is important, it's also really important to grow. And it's really important to have fun while you're doing it. And I, I just think that's always been the connection. If I look at the through line throughout my life, I've always told stories. It's just a matter of how I did it. First, it was getting up in front of people and pretending to be somebody else. And then later, when I was a teenager, I picked up a, the first home sound movie camera and started editing and shooting ectochrome movies and doing Monty Python skits and things like that and telling stories and jokes and even doing some dramas. And then uh, after that, I got into directing and writing. And eventually, that took me to producing and editing and television. And, uh, and even doing some novel writing. So I guess I guess it's fair to say that I'm a story junkie. I, I love reading books. I love watching television. I love watching films. I love seeing speakers that can tell a great story. It doesn't really matter that much to me how the story comes in, as long as it's real, as long as it's interesting, and as long as I can grow from it and there's something to relate to. So I, I feel that now as I work with businesses and I help people come out of their shells and really get to the point where they're comfortable being in front of the camera and comfortable telling their story, I do get a sense of giving back and I do get a sense that they're finally able to be seen. And my slogan is because you deserve to be seen. And I feel deep down, everybody feels that way about themselves, but there's, there's a part of us that where we want to feel worthy. We want to feel worthy of being seen. And by coming up with a story and by sharing something that's of value to other people, we're able to accomplish that. And I think almost everybody has that within them. It's just a matter of tapping into it. So there's a, an interesting thought there about this worthiness business. Uh, and so I actually have two questions. We'll get back to the worthy in a minute. Okay. What is there in Peter's heart that makes him want to help other people tell their stories in an effective way? Like you could have learned it yourself and, you know, done stories or whatever, but you, you want to help people tell their story. Why, why is that what's in your heart? Well, I've always, I've always been hungry for relating to people on a deep level. Uh, I've always had friends that, that I could relate to on that level. And a lot of my life, I felt starved or deprived 
in, in my communication with other people. And as I speak to people and I talk to people, a lot of people feel this way. And in, in the world today, you know, communication is very fast and, and, and there's a lot, of, a lot of ways that are impersonal to communicate. And I think now more than ever, it's really vital that people do feel connected, not just to their story, but affected by other people's stories. So I kind of feel it's a twofold thing. It's a double-edged sword. So by, by connecting with people in a way where they're comfortable enough to share their story and create a story that, that they feel worthy of telling, that's, that's doing the world a favor by making them feel good about it. But it's also doing the world a favor by getting that story out there and having people out there that can benefit from it and be influenced by it and, and, and have that connection. It, you know, it sounds cliche, but I do believe that it does make the world a better place that the more honest, honestly, people can relate to each other. And the more people can understand each other on a deeper level, the more we realize that we're similar and can benefit from it, from each other's experiences. And I do feel a strong desire, a strong drive to do that. I have that need myself and I like fulfilling that need with other people. And the reason that's gone into businesses is because between my years of television, which I'm sure we're going to talk about here eventually, but between my experience in television and now, I also had a lot of experience working with businesses and being a business coach. And I got a lot of satisfaction out of creating success and helping uh, people achieve their goals and find their goals. And now the combination of my skills in storytelling and my skills of creating video and creating honest and, and effective videos has kind of merged into that. So getting the immediate response and getting the immediate reaction to clients with what I do now is incredibly satisfying. I, I really enjoy it. It's uh, the best word would be fulfilling, I would say. And Fabulous. Well, I'm grateful that you're doing it. I'm grateful that you, the phrase I use all the time is add good to the world. And I don't mm -hmm. think it's cliche at all. People are starved. People want to tell stories. They want to feel connected. And everything that's going on in the world is in the direction of disconnection. Right. And your, you know, fragmentation of families, uh, doing everything from home. You know, everything is not, I won't say everything, but lots of stuff's moving in the direction of isolation and disconnection. Yes. You said one more thing I want to talk about in terms of motivation and, and before we get into some other stuff. You said people don't feel worthy. You use the word worthy. So I want to, what's going on? What is yeah. it that we have created? So there's this unworthiness epidemic. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's a lot of ways to approach that. I, I'll just, I'll just address the most obvious one. We're a capitalistic society. And a lot of the time our worth is connected with the amount of money we make or how famous we are, or which people said we were good and which people said we weren't, which people said we were valid, which people said we weren't. It doesn't really matter how secure you are, how wealthy you are, any of that stuff. There's always a voice inside of you that says, oh, you're faking this. Or, oh, you know what? You're actually boring. So you better turn it up a little bit so people don't think you're boring. I go through this. And, and I do believe that most people go through this. And when I talk to people, that's usually the initial response is, you know, yeah, I like it and, and I think it's cool, but people don't really want to hear about this. And that's absolutely not true. When I talk to people, it doesn't matter what they do for a living. They could be a tax preparer. It doesn't really matter. The reason, if the reason they got into it is something that they're connected to, then their story is worthy because even if, even if I don't like to prepare taxes, which I absolutely do not, it's, it's one of the last <laughs> things I want to do, right? Yeah, think, me too. I think a lot of us are on board with that. But there's somebody out there that loves doing it. And they love doing what they do for the same reason that I love doing what I do. They feel they're helping people. They feel they're solving problems. They're moving, they're moving people along to the next level so they can have a happy, uncluttered, satisfied way of life. And that's essentially what most of us with good hearts are trying to do. So I think that worthiness comes from a lot of places, but I think the first place would be maybe financial worth, or you feel people don't really want to spend the time to hear you or talk to you or hear about your thing, because we all hear, oh, don't talk about yourself. Don't bore people with your story. I think we're all kind of inundated with that as we're growing up or told, you know, only speak about it when asked and things like that. And there's some truth to that, but it creates this it creates this void inside of us that makes us question when it's valid for us to communicate and when it's not. 
And if you're in touch with who you are and you're in touch with what your story is and you've been inspired by your story or you've been inspired by somebody else's story, it's always valid. I can't think of a case where it's not. The only time I get bored and think that people shouldn't be on stage or shouldn't be talking or shouldn't be on video is when they're lying, when they're just trying to make a sale for sales sake or they have some motivation that I personally don't agree with. Otherwise, I feel everybody is valid in their storytelling and, and, there's, a, and there's a strong purpose and a strong reason behind it and has, it has value on many levels. So let's dig into some of the places that your excitement took you. You started as a kid, small kid with <laughs> makes up sets and I don't know, fake swords and castles and who knows, sure. right? All that stuff. And then you all, yeah, went through high school and then you got yourself out into uh, television yep. and you were quite successful there. So talk a little bit about that evolution, evolution. And sure. I know you've won some awards and let's go yep. ahead and brag about that that's okay. good too people don't I'll, know I'll, that because i didn't say that but tell us about that journey oh uh, well yeah i'll brag a little bit so my journey went from acting when i was a kid to teenager to early adult years and then i decided i wanted to um to start writing my material so i got into improv and stand-up comedy for a little while so i did that in in the dc area and the baltimore area in the late 80s when i was in my early 20s and that was very short lived because that's, that's a tough career. And I actually, I, there was a really funny, funny guy, a guy named Doug that I was really good friends with. I'm still friends with him. This guy was the funniest guy in the world. He could, he could contort him, contort his face like Jim Carrey. Right. And he was incredibly <laughs> funny. So he didn't really have a lot of writing skills, but his performance skills and his ability to make an audience laugh hysterically was, was all, was all there. So we teamed up and I, I would, I would write the sketches and I would set them up. I was more, you know, the normal guy, the straight guy in the, in the group. But that got me into writing and that got me into storytelling with scripts. And from there, I wrote and produced some plays. I went, I moved up to Boston and I wrote and produced some plays up there. I uh, did uh, two or three plays up there. And then I was like, you know what? I think that I want to get into television. So I went back to school for television. I was originally there for acting. So I went to Emerson up in Boston and graduated with a television degree and then straight to L.A., to sell a screenplay and to sell some teleplays. So I was writing, 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 writing. And just at that time, post-production was starting to take off. The whole idea of a digital timeline and computerized editing was just starting. Avid was just coming up. You know, we're talking about the early 90s now. Right. So I, you know, I got a bunch of writing jobs. I read a lot of scripts. I did a lot of um, pre-production stuff. But I didn't really know how to sell my own scripts. I wasn't, I wasn't really clear on how to do that. I didn't really understand how that was done. And the opportunity to start doing post-production was right there. It's like, wait, I can make $100,000 a year right now. I just need to get in front of a, uh, an Avid and learn how to do it and start, and start cutting stuff. And back in the early and mid-90s, it was, it was rare to have that skill. Now everyone and their brother knows how to edit. They know how, what a timeline is. Back then, it was just going from tape to tape or actually cutting film to these new systems. And I just really connected. I, I felt like, you know, it was avid at the time. I felt like it was an extension of my brain. So I could, I could, I could control audio and I could control video and I could, I, could, I could get the rhythm. And I could, as I mentioned earlier, I could tell the story in a lot of different ways. There could be an interview where somebody's talking about something and I could get the music to get the mood right and I could get the pacing to get the mood right and I could put the right effects on and the right transitions and so on and so forth. So I started freelancing as a producer editor and I ended up uh, getting a job at KABC TV in Los Angeles back in 1998. <laughs> for a lot of people, that's a long time ago. And I was there for 21 years. And I, and I worked on a lot of shows, produced and edited, cranked out shows every day, told stories every day. And during my tenure there, I did win uh, four Emmys. Two were for a show called uh, I in LA and two were show, for a show called This to LA. I'm sorry. Two were for producing I in LA. One was for editing I in LA and one was for producing Vista. And the one I'm most proud of, we did a special called The Legends of Laurel Canyon, where I was a co-producer. And I have a personal love for music, and I know you do too, Kellen. And just, it was amazing to be able to interview these icons that had come up in Laurel Canyon, the Zappa family, you know, Frank Zappa was already gone, but the Zappa family and, you know, Mickey Dolenz and, 
you know, it's just, it, it was amazing, you know, Joni Mitchell. And so that, that show I would say was like the pinnacle of, of my storytelling satisfaction while I was at ABC. And it had a life beyond the show that it was in. It, it, it aired, you know, in many different formats. It was, it was at the, uh, the Grammy museum. I just, I just really loved it. And what's great about television, if you have a career in television, you know, I was, I was a staff, a staff person. So this was like my nine to five job. And, you know, every once in a while I'd be like, okay, so now part of this nine to five job is you get to go to an award show and get a statue and go home. <laughs> How great is that, right? <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> <clears throat> so so yeah, that, that was that was really great and you know at the end of the day it was telling story after story after story and and really just having the the creative latitude to be able to have my hands on all the elements that put that story together and much of the time be the one that set it up and did the interviews and you know made made something out of uh, out of uh, elements that just in and of themselves wouldn't have been much, but you put them all together and you get a really nice story. You get a really nice show. So I want to dig into that piece. You won some awards, people, mm -hmm. you know, an Emmy award is a big deal in that industry and you have not one, not two, but four of them. Right. And the, the one that you were talking about, you know, continues to have some, some legs because of, uh, because of the subject matter and because of what you did. What struck me as you told that is the, you know, the storyboarding, the production piece where you sort of figure out how to take all these elements together. Because when you when when someone untrained me watches a thing and all these things happen, you know, you don't you enjoy the movement and the pacing and everything else. But you don't think about and you shouldn't think about all of the work that went into creating that. Right. Right. So talk for a minute about this creative because you know this the premise of this show is how to add good to the world using your gifts and you have a right. gift this eye and this thought process of the story talk a little bit about creating a flow maybe pick one of those as an example or another one if you want to about conceptualizing it and organizing the elements to create that seamless and riveting outcome that we the viewers get to enjoy yeah, well, I would say the way that it's that it that it pertains to what I'm doing now is that here, here's the difference between now and 20 years ago. Everybody has multiple media just sitting in their phone. They have thousands of hours of video, they have tens of thousands, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of photos. They they've documented their lives, especially the younger generation. They have all this material. It's already, in, it's already in existence. So what I look at now is if somebody has a story and they're telling their story and, you know, it can be an hour long interview or a couple hours of, of interview where you really get to the bottom of things, you really get to people's story, you find out what, what they want to talk about, they, you find out what their business is and why they're in it. And then you have all this amazing footage and amazing photos and videos and YouTube stuff and, you know, whatever social stuff they have. There's so much material to work with now that you can almost put together a tangible story, a tangible show without having to create new material other than the interview. So when you talk about value, when you talk about bringing good to the world, I feel my mission at the moment, and it's going to evolve because they always do, but my mission at the moment is for people to realize how much they already have. They already have their story and they already have their material. And if they have me, they have someone that knows how to put that together in a way that's going to tell a story the best possible by the best possible means. So the person that's telling the story can look at their video and go, that's what I meant. That's what I wanted people to know. That's what I want them to understand about me. And this is going to make them excited about what I'm already excited about. So as far as putting good back in the world and utilizing my skills for that, it's on a very personal individual level right now. Maybe someday it'll go back to a broad level with a film or a documentary, but I really like the fact that I am producer and editor for hire right now because these people just don't know how to do it otherwise. 
and they don't know the difference between hiring a Fiverr team or hiring a, a team that you farm stuff out that don't have the sensibilities and the difference between how their story will be told uh, if they're working with someone who has made thousands of hours of television and spend their whole life telling stories, I want to work with them. I don't want to be their producer. I want to be their co-producer. And I want to understand what their story is. I want to take it in. I want to become a part of it. And, and I think that's what's really exciting to about this whole thing that I'm doing is that I've always, I've always felt connected, not just to the people, not just not just to the story, but to the material also, because to me, it, it's a huge synergistic sandwich. And it's and, and if you make the sandwich right, it's the best sandwich you've ever had. And I just, <laughs> I just want people to have that opportunity. That's wonderful. So you you as you describe this, it's really compelling in terms of your skill and ability and the, the experiences you've had. Can you think right now of one or two stories <clears throat> that you've told and maybe it's one of the uh ones you won an award for and maybe it's something different where you feel like you told that really well the person was not only overjoyed at the truth of the expression of what what happened but also the effect where they were you know excited or maybe blown away completely by the effect that it had not only when they saw how you co-produced their story with them, but when others were able to react to that in a in an exciting way that was gratifying for both of you. Do you have a story about that that you can tell? Yeah, well, I, I have one. I, I was working with a woman who um, she she worked in aquatics, so she was um, she was very much into uh, the ecological. Uh, ramifications of of what we're doing in our oceans and how and how the wildlife in the oceans are treated, and then also it, just anything that had to do with water. So she was very into clean drinking water and how water affects our health, and you know all the way down to like you know using high acid water instead of cleaning products and things like that. So she was she was on this path in her life, and she was a she was also a scuba diver photographer, and what happened to her was she was on a, a boat. And it was, it was a whale boat and she was uh, out there to take pictures of whales. And, and I think she was planning on actually scuba diving. Well, they were going really fast. They were going however many knots, 20 miles an hour is that's very fast on the water. And she was in the front of the boat and they, they hit a whale and she was, you know, she was hanging on to the, to the rail and she permanently disfigured her arm. So she could no longer do a lot of the things that she used to be able to do. And, you know, it, it almost killed her and it really changed her life. It was, she could have quit. Essentially, she could have just said, I'm done. Her photography days were over. Her scuba diving days were over. The type of work she was doing, uh, the ocean work that she was doing was over. But what she decided she could do is she could inform people about their personal use of water, that she could, that, that she was working with a system that enabled people to, have the best drinking water and have the best water to shower in and have the best cleaning. So she focused on that product. So, you know, as you know, I'm working with business owners now. So when she told her story and she, and she established her passion for ecology and her passion for water and her, under, and her deep understanding of how these systems work far deeper than how I'm describing it now, but she did, she did a fantastic job in doing that. And her story was so deep and so heart wrenching that, Everyone connected. Everyone connected. It didn't matter, you know, if, if if people cared about the ecology or they cared about the ocean. They cared about her because she was real and she had been through a hard time and she had lost a lot and she had to come back and bring it back. So she no longer had to go and try to sell these systems. She was now a water expert and these systems were just a natural place for people to go to take advantage of her expertise and have her facilitate that. So it did, it did great for her business, but it also, the story raised people's awareness. Now, is this, this is nothing that I'm ever going to get an award for. I'm not, I'm not going to get a, a, an Emmy for this. I, you know, it's not going to be a documentary, although it probably could be. But <laughs> the fact, the fact that, that, that she was willing to put herself out there and, and express her pain and not try to paint a picture that made her look better or worse or different than how things really were, 
people understand that people can see that. And, you know, this reminds me, I have, I, I say this all the time, bad video is worse than no video. You can, you know, you said it's a visceral, a visceral medium that right. the minute, the minute you see a video almost from the very beginning, you decide whether you like that person or not. And it's, and it's, it's pretty instantaneous. So if you're trying to pull one over on someone and you're, you're not being genuine or you're trying to be man manipulative, the majority of people that are watching that video are going to be put off by that. They're not going to, they're not going to buy into it. So I, I think it's, it's doing, it's doing a lot of people a favor, as I said, not just the people that are creating the videos, not just the people that the videos represent, but the potential clients get to establish a real relationship with someone before they even meet them. And as you said, there's such a huge disconnect in the world right now. I, I just feel like it would patch it up if we just, if we just keep doing that the right way, that it could really patch that up quite a bit. So that's wonderful. So after you made that story with her and she was then became a legit like water expert and everything, and you said it helped her, you know, the business and so forth, what happened or is happening with her personally in terms of how what you created helped her helped her navigate this abrupt and dramatic change in her life. I mean, she coped with it well, created a business and water and everything else. Right. But I have a sense that there's more to the story in terms of her ability to move past such a dramatic thing. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know the the happy ending is that she she doesn't have to struggle financially anymore. Um, not just not just with her business, but you know now she's a speaker, and she knows her story, and she can identify with her story, and she can bring more to it every time because that door's been open, and and she can see that there's that there's love out there for her, and th and that there's people that can relate to her. So from a financial perspective, it's great because you know she's out there and pe people are very interested in her, but from a personal perspective, she can she can own her story now and she can, she can build it the way she wants to build it. And if, and if her story changes and there's something else that she wants to include or some other way that she wants to grow, that becomes a part of her process. So she's, she's learned to tell that specific story, but she's also learned to process and she's learned to trust the medium and know that it can, it can work in your favor. It can appeal to mass amounts of people on a very personal and what feels like a one-to-one -one level. So I, you know, I'm only speculating what her takeaways are, but that that those would be the main ones that I would speculate. So, so I'm gonna th that strikes a chord with me, because you know a little bit about my story. We've talked about yeah. some things, and <clears throat> I have a really, really dramatic story, et cetera, et cetera, with things that happened in my life. But there was a time when I was convinced that I had nothing to offer, that I had no story at all. Yeah. And when I've told people my story and then tell them the event that I had, the experience that I had about say, thinking I had no story, they're shocked and it's like, yeah, 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 you know, you're crazy. Right. And so I know that transition or that awareness that is possible for anyone. So when someone comes to you and I, what happened to me is I stomped out of an event in angry and in tears, thinking yeah. I had no story. And it was an event put on by a high-powered storyteller and thinking I had no story. And of course I do, and I've written all these books. When someone comes to you and they are convinced they have no story that is worth telling either for their business or for anything like that, they're sure, I got nothing. Me, I got nothing. That was my line, stomping out of the event, right? right. So if someone believes that, mm -hmm. where do you go to help them first identify and then connect to that story? You ask them about what they're passionate about. That's where you always start. Why, why are you in this business? Why are you, why do, why do you want to tell this story? And they get into it. And you know, at first it, 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 they're a little shy maybe, but if you, if you keep asking the questions and you keep having the conversations, and you have genuine curiosity, that curiosity brings out their story and their story gets more and more and more and more interesting. And what's, 
And what's cool about making video, by the time you're rolling, by the time you're actually doing an interview, you've already had the conversations, you've already guided them and established what's interesting, or at least what's intrigues you as the interviewer, as the producer, you know, and, and once they've had that conversation and they could see, wow, you know, his, his pupils were dilated and <laughs> he was really listening to what I was saying. And he really cares, not because he's an expert, not because I'm a great orator, but because the story itself actually means something. And my experience actually has value. So I, I think that's the starting point. And, you know, I don't think it's as, uh, as dramatic as that. I don't think, I don't think people actually go, Oh, I'm now I'm great. You know, now I'm interesting and I, I can do anything, but it, I think it's, I think it's the beginning. And when you start pulling the video out and you start getting these great little moments, because that's what video is. It's finding these perfect little moments and then putting them together the right way. So when those moments are put together the right way, suddenly this person just, they become, they become a rock star. They become, this amazing storyteller and they have this level of celebrity and charisma that they never thought was possible because all the elements are being put together. But it all starts with those first conversations where you're just really asking, okay, so you do this because you like, you know, let's say doing taxes. That's like the worst example, right? <laughs> um, you like doing taxes. Why? Because people suffer, people suffer the numbers they don't understand it. They don't, they, they don't know why they can't figure it out. It's beyond them. So it gives me satisfaction knowing that I'm solving that problem because I'm a good person. And here's, here's some other things, other problems I like to solve that have nothing to do with taxes. And now we like them. Now we like who they are. And they're like, well, that's fine that they're an accountant. I don't mind. You know, so, you know, I use that as the most, most extreme example. But, you know, most people are far more interesting. Sorry, accountants. Most people are far more. <laughs> no, you don't have to apologize. That's fine. <laughs> you know, than doing taxes or crunching numbers or, or or whatever it might be, it's it's what's behind it. It's the heart that's behind it. It's why they care. It's how they can help people, and it's how they and it's how they've grown as as human beings doing doing whatever it is they do. So it's identifying those passions right away and finding out what their you know core values is the number one. First, you find out their core values, and then you work you work it from there. And, you know, you know this, you're a business coach, right? And so you know that when people are out of sync with those core values, whether it's their top three or their top five, they're like, this person annoys me and I can never get them to do what I want. Or I have this employee and I just, I'm just up at night every night. I don't know what it is, but I, I just can't solve this problem. Well, nine times out of 10, it's because something's going on that's misaligning with these core values and they're forced to do something that goes against their central belief system. And this is true of stories as well. It goes as deep as that. And I think once you, once you find those core values, you understand what they are from there, you, you can build your mission statement from your mission statement. You can build your first 10 topics. And then from those topics, you get script after script or story after story after story. So that's how it builds. I love that. I want to ask another question. Um, people that have interesting stories or that have been helped to realize that the story they have is powerful and they get that rock star moment you talked about a minute yeah. ago because someone's helped them put the tidbits together in a powerful way. Right. Would you be willing to say that you think most people, and I realize I'm generalizing, okay, yeah. I don't care. Do you think that most people that are 45, by the time they get to 45 or 50, that they actually have a story that with the right love and attention and curiosity and inquiry about values and all the rest, that they have a story that would be powerful and compelling if it were put together well? Absolutely. If you've lived that long, you've had to overcome all kinds of adversity and all kinds of obstacles. And you've had to You've had to come, you've had to take on a, a level of wisdom that has enabled you to get to where you are. And whether you're aware of it or not, and whether you understand the value of that or not, yes. And I don't even think you have to be around that long. Now I'm going to throw this back to you for a minute. So I don't know how many people know Kellen's story, and I, I just know a little bit about it. But I could say that Kellen could have told his story when he was 12, and it would have been intriguing. 
So it, it, it just really, it depends on the individual and it depends on the circumstances. But I would say, I, you know, I could have told the story when I was 12. That would have been very different from the story I tell now. But I think in, a, in its own way, it would have been heart wrenching at any point. And it would have been, the, we always have these heartbreaks in our lives. The, there are things that, that seem like the end of the world at the time that actually push us to success and push us to these moments of epiphany where we move on to the next thing that we would have never gotten to had what we think is the bad, had the bad thing not happen. And I, I, I mean, we can, most of us can trace those back probably as pretty much as far as we can remember. I totally agree with that. And I, I, I agree with you. And I picked 40 or 45 to make it a softball question because <laughs> I, I totally think that if people understood the value of their experiences and, you know, I think life was designed to have us have these experiences so we would develop. Right. And yeah, some people seem to have more difficulty and struggle thrust upon them than others. Yeah. I 100% agree. Every single person. I, I've never met, let's put it this way, I have personally never met and talked to people, and I've talked to lots, that that after a little while, it isn't clear to me that they have a story, that they have a passion, that they have a capability, and if they want to, they can use that set of experiences and story to either move the business they've got forward or build a different business and in their own way, gifts and talents add good to the world. Is that true as far as you're concerned? That's absolutely true. I, I think that I think I think we're we're coming out of the same philosophy here. And I, yeah, I I think it can always be, if it's if it's honest, and if you and if you really learned from your experience and truly allowed yourself to learn, only good can come out of it. Only good. I I feel that all the bad comes from denial and um, trying to make yourself look better than you are. And you know, we all we all want to save face, like. If I were to tell my story, even over the last three years, it would be painful. It would be hard for me to tell the story. Now, would it benefit other people to hear the story? Yes. Could other people grow from hearing the story? Yes. Would I be embarrassed? Would I feel a sense of, of shame and exposure in telling the story? Very possibly. But after the story was told and told the right way, those feelings would dissipate. Those feelings would go away. And that's where the courage comes in. And it does take a certain amount of courage to tell, you know, if it's a deep story, to tell your story the right way. Let, let's say you become a keynote speaker, you become a TED Talk expert. Yes, you got to go there. You know, you you got to you got to <laughs> you show your fall. You got your fall has to hurt. We have to hurt with you. We have to take that. We have to take that fall with you. We have to think at some point in the talk. Wow, I don't see how he could have possibly or she could have possibly come out of this. And how how are they even here today telling the story? That's a good story. Now, the, the courage, the shame, and the bravery all has to play a role in that. Now, does it need to be on these extreme levels for you to make an effective video for your business? Absolutely not. <laughs> it, does, it, does, it does not have to be on that level. But the closest you can come to that level of honesty, the closest you can come, if you're saying, oh, no, 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 I don't want to talk about that, that's probably the first place you want to start. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Thank you. I want everybody to hear that. The thing you're most afraid of is the thing that contains the most power for you, the most build up, the most love, the most connection. And when you started in the beginning with the truth of the connection between the person, the story is the key. I want to ask you about dishonesty yeah. and fakery and okay. all the stuff that you've mentioned a couple of times. Two, two parts to this question. One, why is it so prevalent? Why are there so many people that live in the highlight reel that pretend that feel a need compel, compelled to be bogus about that? Why is that happening? And I want you to leave us in that. The second part is help people understand why that is so not only ineffective, but offensive in terms of creating the kind of power that you're talking about. I, I wish I knew why, Kellen. <laughs> um, I mean, my, my, my instinct is to say that it's, that it's fear-based. So I, I just think people are afraid of being wrong. I think people are afraid of falling. Like, why, why are people compulsive liars? You know, not everyone's, there are bad people that are compulsive liars, but there are a lot of halfway decent people that are just kind of confused and, and misguided. And they just, 
They just feel like it, it, it comes from what we were talking about earlier. They don't feel there's value to the truth. They don't feel their truth is good enough. So they feel they need to insulate it in some way and create a more interesting story and, and, and fabricate and embellish and, you know, and so forth. So I would say from an honest perspective, like if you have an honest person and they're, and they're telling you a story just so they look good, like, yeah, I was always the number one touchdown scorer on my football team. And I always had the best looking girlfriend and I drove a really great car, you know, people's response to that is so, so what, what, I mean, I, why would I want to be friends with you? You all, you, all, you got everything easily. So what, who cares? What we, what we're, what we're going to connect to is somebody that's more brave than we are that can say, you know what? The mediocre looking woman at girl in, in high school rejected me. <laughs> like yes. how hard would it be to say that, you know, how, right, right. but like if somebody else said it, you'd be like, wow, I want to hear what else this person has to say, because now I believe them because there is no way they made that up. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's, I think it's fear. Um, I think it's fear. And I think that there's, you know, we talked about celebrity a little bit and I, I actually want to get into that just briefly because I think it connects to this. So the way celebrity is presented to us now is these, these perfect looking people that are good at everything or, they're they're notorious for some stupid reason that they that they created right that we don't necessarily respect or at least the older generation doesn't respect so my interpretation of celebrity is someone who has this honest charisma about them where people really want to hear what they have to say and they really want to be a part of their movement to me that's true celebrity and i don't want you know i don't want the listeners to think that you know, I'm talking about this sparkly red carpet kind of thing because I'm because I'm not at all. And believe me, I was in that world for a long time. And personally, it does not have a lot of value to me. And I think I think the people that put that level of celebrity celebrity or that interpretation of celebrity to, as value to what they're doing, they're making a big mistake. And I think that may be part of the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. They want to be a part of that school of celebrity and they want to continue to cover their fears. They want to be cool. People want to be cool. They don't want to be uncool, but as we all know, uncool is cool. <laughs> uncool is the new black. All right. <laughs> so how, how the last little piece I want you to augment a little bit. How does that, when someone is in that school yeah. of fake celebrity or dishonesty a little or a lot, yep. how is that not, it's damages in there. Talk a little bit about how damaging that is. I yeah. think it feels along the lines of bad videos worse than no video. How right. is that uh, damaging? The, yeah, well, the best example I can think of is 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 women's women's body image. So, you know, throughout the throughout my life, really, it's you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, when, as I was coming up, there were there were a lot, there were some very specific images, and that's true now, and it's it's been true for a long time. Some very specific images on how women are supposed to look what's considered sexy, what's considered appealing, what's considered famous, what's considered successful. And I think it's done an amazing amount of damage to women's body images and even to their, uh, the, way, the way that they've developed their personalities. And, you know, anorexia and, you know, uh, getting a lot of work done on their face because 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 of ageism and so forth. And I, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to take a stance on any of those things. But I, I think it's just it's just a I think it's a good example of the damage. You say what damage can it cause? The mm -hmm. dis the dishonesty of that being the norm creates a false society with false expectations. And those expectations are damaging because they hurt people's self-image and they hurt people's ability to do good and to, and to bring the best of themselves and to share the best of themselves with the rest of us. If, if we're going to raise the bar to, to a level of truth and a level of true communication, that can't really be a part of it. We have to kind of, you know, if somebody's gorgeous and, and, and they're a certain body type and that's who they really are, that's not a problem but don't create a false norm for the rest of the world. And I, and I think that's really damaging on a lot of different levels. That's the most tangible example I can think of of that. 
That's fabulous. So we're, we're running short now on time. Okay. I want you to tell us how people can find you. Where Absolutely. can people find so, more about Peter? Sure. Um, I can I can work with, with any business owner, anyone that wants to promote themselves, uh, speakers, coaches, whether you sell a product service, you can contact me through peterw360.com. And that will take you to a hub where you can you can watch my videos. You can see examples of what I've done. You can go to my website. You can download some free stuff. You can uh, you can check out the packages that I offer, and you can book a conversation with me. I'm always open for conferences and conversations, and see what it is that you're looking to do, and how we can get you on video and get you past your camera shyness. And uh, I'm going to add your camera dishonesty. I wouldn't have normally said that, but that's what we talked about today. So. Maybe camera I mean, dishonesty is really something we need to address. And I, I would love to address that. I love it. I love you. I love everything you're about. P, PeterW360.com. Is that what you said? Yep. Peter, Peter w 360com yep. PeterW360.com. Peter, I want to thank you for being with me today, for sharing your heart, your the way you're adding good to the world, and for all that you're doing right here, right now to help people be honest, create themselves, and move the conversation in that way forward. Thanks so much, Kellen. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. I appreciate your energy. So I want you to take a minute, not a minute, a whole hour, and listen to this again. Why? Because Peter is the real deal. The awards are real. The skill is real. His ability to help you is real. And this isn't a sales pitch for him, but this is an, a request for you to examine your own authenticity, to get rid of your own fears, because you know what we need? We need truth. We need you to show up as the real you with your gifts and talents so you can create your ultimate life. You're listening to Your Ultimate Life with Kellen Flukiger, only on LA Talk Radio.